Argumentative part of me is pure ego, but when I do that, the ego is fed, but my soul is is taken away, and I feel bad. I feel I feel like a bit of bit of my soul is a bit. I, I get a pang of not depression because it's not that, but I get a pang of like oh, heavy hearted because my soul doesn't want to argue with people, whether it's strangers on the internet, people on the street, whether my family or my friends. I don't want to argue, and actually. I think if you have good communication skills, like you said, Derek, you don't have to let it get to that stage or take it somewhere. You can usually pacify most situations if you just that split second of whether you listen to your ego or your wisdom would would decide for where you go next. And it's a millisecond of a moment you have to make that decision. And sometimes I make most of the time, I will say I make it the right decision. Ninety five percent of the time. I'm on it. I make the right decision. 5% I'm working on. I think, Christine, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just, um, it's a weird question. I'm not entirely sure how to phrase it, but maybe you'll make something out of it. That person that you see on the television and on Twitter and social media, do you see that as being you? Or do you, do you see it as, as almost being like two separate people? There's the real you your true self and then there's this this construct that's actually not real yes I think I do I think I think uh, two two things I don't know whether I think of them as two things because I've had to detach because of the trauma and the person she was I didn't like so I've had to mentally detach from her or whether I genuinely do think um, I I feel when I look at pictures and things come come up, I feel sad for her. I feel sad for her. She didn't have a clue what was coming. She had no clue what the the train wreck that was coming her way. And I just, my heart kind of goes out to her because I'm like, wow, like you, I'll see pictures on Time Hop will pop up from like a few years back and I'll be like, you know, out drinking you know, having a glass of champagne I've got all my makeup done from filming and I'm like she she would it's like Jaws all I hear is da 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 every time I see a picture I'm like it's coming I didn't have a clue so I find at the moment I still find it quite difficult to look back at those times um because I find it quite hard because my first instinct is it's not fair I just feel I feel very I feel very hard done by I, I'm not I wouldn't change it but I still do feel hard done by I feel like it didn't have to go down the way it went down but also at the same time it did and so I have to just I have to be okay with that and I will you know every time is wonderful and, and all the time that I grow and learn and move on I, I will feel better but I definitely do look at her as a different a, a different but I also think I played you know I played up to it or I was different I did play up to the camera you know I was it was a bit of like Lady Nard is in the building boom and it was you know it was a bit of a show um which helped um you know be able to go home and just kind of take my lashes off and just be like oh this is me <laughs> um but yeah I definitely definitely did definitely a disconnect for sure Peter. And yeah, Nadia, um, do you know if the media companies, you know, the production companies and now um, are actually helping the presenters at all with bullying, you know, cyberbullying and that sort of stuff? Do you happen to know any of that? I, I think that they, the people that are on telly get maybe a phone call every six months asking if they're okay. Um, I think that uh, as Caroline Flack proved, and I know things have changed since she passed, but I'd, I think if somebody did something like Caroline Flack, I'd be very, very surprised if they 
being behaved and, and in quite it. Yeah, skeptic. Yeah. Um, I think that comes with the territory. Also, um, a lot of a lot of times I'm in uh, the, the the finance business or in well a lot in medical business, but um, and they have that kind of mindset where they're like, well, what are you saying? Now, what I always make sure of doing is speaking in a language and, and using examples from their world so that it becomes real to them. So, for instance, I can ask a question like, when you have a really great idea, when you've, when you've you know, been thinking about a problem that you've had and, and suddenly you have a great idea uh, of, of how to solve it, where does it come from? When does it come? And they kind of are taking it back a little bit. And then they go, oh, I often get great ideas in the shower. Or, oh, when I, when I go for a walk with my dog or play with my kids, you know. And I'm like, isn't that interesting? Why do you think that is? Where does it come from? And now I'm already just in that conversation going from something that's so well we have to solve this problem to yeah but where does the problem solving come from so now we're starting to go from the world of form with the challenges and the issues that are there to the formless world the principles world where the solutions are so so that transition to even start talking about there's something that's the problem and then there's a, a space the where solutions seem to be that we access more easily when we're not thinking about it. Now, this is an experience that every single adult person have had. There's nobody who, who says, no, no, that never happens. I only find solutions when I really think hard about it. Never happened. So I use examples like that, lots of them. So many that people go, oh, oh yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, when, I, when I'm in a low mood, I, my, my, uh, the challenges that I have look impossible. I see that you're right. Oh, when that happens, then so so there's so many examples um, that that they just kind of go. But of course, so once they've seen, oh yeah, that this these things are going on right in front of my eyes. I just don't notice. So I'm pointing to towards something that's true, and that's really my superpower. That I'm speaking about truth. It's not something I've invented. There's no theories that, that document it. It's, it's, it's documented through life, through our own lives. So if I touch something that's true to the individual, of course they're going to go, oh, yeah. And especially if I don't try and convince them. Trying to convince something is always going to get people in their ego and then they're going to try and fight me. But first of all, I know this is true. I've seen it. I know it in my own life. I've seen it in thousands of people's lives that have changed because of this. So there's a there's a grounding in where I where I'm coming from that people can feel. That's the one thing. And the other thing is using examples from their life where they go, oh yeah, gosh, I can like in a group, I'll go, so do you do you know the experience of you have a challenging um, an assignment you have to do, a project you're doing? And uh, and at some times of the day, especially if you haven't slept well, it seems impossible and you're never going to get through it. And then at some point that changes and you're suddenly like, oh, and you do it. And 20 minutes later, it's done. Everybody goes, yeah. Well, why do you think that is? Where do you think that comes from? So it's really about talking about and taking examples from, from people's lives that every single human being know, all of them. Uh, uh, I wasn't sleeping like I'd, I'd wake up every hour on the hour all night long. So I was a mess. I was, I was not a very healthy person. But I knew that there was something that was missing in my work. And I, and I knew that it was spiritual what was missing. So I decided to study with a psychic. So that was my that was the that was the best I could do. Um, so I um, started to study with a psychic, and I remember one day we went to this um, uh, astro traveling workshop, and that's when you kind of leave your body and go travel around. So we're we're in this big room, and everybody's laying on the ground, and and she's doing this relaxation thing, and then says, "Okay, go go cruise around." 
And I'm like still there, right? I haven't gone anywhere. And I open my eye and I look around and everybody else is still there. I thought, okay, this is really something's uh, a little crazy because when people came back, they had stories. They went to North Minneapolis and they went over here and they went over there. They had all these stories. And it hit me the power of our imagination that we could think that that was going to happen and then literally create that reality. And that was kind of my first uh, insight really that I got about the power of thought to create reality in, in my, in my mind anyway. So I, I continued on. I, um, I remember I went to a psychic and she was um, some famous psychic from Chicago that came into Minneapolis and she was uh, seeing people. And the whole time I was there, she was itching because she had hives all over her body. And The only thing that she got right in the reading was that I would be traveling a lot, but that's probably true about anybody in the world. But thank God it wasn't the truth because she said I was going to die when I was 42. So um, she was like, you got a really short lifeline. You're going to die when you're 42. So let me tell you, going through age 42 to 43, I was holding my breath. But um, I, I, I made that long ago. So So that wasn't working. And then um, at the same time, I thought that if I found a husband, I'd be happy that my problem was I wanted to get married. You know, I was almost 30. My biological clock was clicking. I, 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 I just really wanted to find a husband. And I kept going to clubs looking for husbands. And of course, I found alcoholics at clubs all the time. I I don't know how that works, but I, I was literally looking for love in all the wrong places. So I had come back from, um, I I was going into my office and I uh, had an office in a a big mansion in Minneapolis and Joseph Bailey, probably some of you may have heard of him, but he had his office, um, the floor down from me. So I was actually in his old office and he was in another office down below and we didn't like each other at all. Um, we, he was a male psychologist and I was a hot dog feminist therapist. And so the two of us never talked ever. And, um, we were, you know, not really friendly, but I came to into the office and he was leaving to go to lunch. He goes, Hey, I'm going to go to lunch. You want to go? And I was like, yeah, okay. So I went with him, which was odd in the first place. And, and then as we were talking, he was talking about this training that he went to in Florida. And he was talking about this woman that he met, which was 90% of the conversation. 10% of the conversation was, oh, and this guy by the name of Sidney Banks was talking. And he was saying some really interesting things and it's changing the way I'm doing my work. Well, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the fact that he met his wife at this training, right? Because I get a new insight from that, like, oh, Maybe if I go to psychology conferences, I'll meet a man that way because that'd be someplace different. So he had this, you know, he he brought up Dr. Roger Mills to do a training and all of the other, not mind you, I had a clinic with about uh, eight therapists in it that I was the, the administrator of and chief partner and everybody was going to his training. And so I thought, well, I got to go too. I can't be the only one out. So I signed up, but I signed up for both days. The second day was optional because I thought if I met somebody the first day, it would look too obvious if I said showed up the second day. So, and as it turned out, I was the first person to sign up for both days. And um, I finished school a little bit early and left my little hometown and went to the big city of Vancouver and um, started university there. And um, um, so at that time, I would I would, you know, like everyone else, uh, a, a victim in a sense of my circumstances, fortunately, often my circumstances were were good and I felt happy and I was very much into being happy and optimistic, but I didn't have kind of the the know-how of how to be happy all the time or more of the time. And uh, so it was a little bit of a yo-yo experience. And at university, I I enrolled in a bachelor of education program to teach K to 12. Um, school in British Columbia. And part of that mandated, um, part of the mandated 
program was to take psychology and quite a bit of it, because psychology, of course, um, lends itself to what we do in special education and so on. Anyway, we'd have these huge lecture halls, all us young people in there learning about psychology and psychology 101 and then 201 and then certain psychology to do with children and so on. And um, you just kind of kept getting sicker. <laughs> Not that I was sick, but I was started to see myself as rather sick as we started learning about these things. And I started, yeah, those parents of mine, I don't know, <laughs> you know, um, they, they, and I started judging them and how they treated me, et cetera, et cetera. And you just started to, um, feel like, wow, I, I, I really need counseling. And so they, the counseling offices were packed with all these young people learning about uh, the psychology of the day. And then um, as um, I started my teaching practicums, um, where you're supervised and you kind of try out your, your skills as um, a student teacher, I realized that um, I really... I had a good skill set. You know, University of British Columbia is wonderful, really state of the art uh, learning that we had. And um, I found that kids who were on a learning path was fine. It was great. I could really connect with them and, and help them and inspire them, et cetera. But kids who were shut down or acting out or belligerent or having issues, I could not, for the life of me, connect with them. So I actually um, thought, well, maybe it's maybe it's me, maybe it's my my issue, and so I actually took a year off my um, program and went to Europe and had a wonderful time. Went to university there in uh, Freiburg and traveled around with people I met. It was wonderful, and then um, when I came back to Vancouver, I thought, well, I'll I'll, I'll try it just once more and see but I started to think of other professions maybe that uh, might, I might be better suited for. So I came back, um, now I'm, uh, I've just had my 21st birthday, um, 1975, and came back to um, Vancouver. And I knew Bob Campbell, he's my husband now, but back then he, we, were, we were good friends and we met in high school. And he invited me to um, the Gulf Islands where he was house sitting. And um, in the year that I'd been away, Europe at the time was much more conservative and formal than America was. So I came back a little bit more formal and, and in the year away, um, he, he was a bit more like a hippie. <laughs> so we were quite, quite a funny looking pair, me in my formal, you know, European clothes, him in his dungarees and ripped jeans and so on. <laughs> but um, we really enjoyed each other's company and we both really loved being happy. But um, in that visit, I realized that Bob actually was quite, he was really on an active search a little bit more, as many, many young people were then and now to more find more meaning to life. And so he was ready to join something and um, kind of leave the mainstream of society. And I thought, well, wow. Um, that's certainly not for me. And I, and I left that island. I still remember kind of leaning on the ferry railing and thinking, well, that's the end of that friendship. I've got to make some new friends in, uh, at university. Over 30 fall. years ago. So I was um, a manager in a bank. Um, and I think I've been working at the bank for about five years. I was in my first kind of supervisory position. Manager's a bit grander word for it at that point. But um, I was sent on a week's coaching course to learn about coaching. And at the end of it, I thought, oh, great, I'm a coach now. And it really, the way that you were, you're taught to speak to people and listen to people and really help people to come up with their own answers just made sense to me not necessarily as a coach but as a leader I was a leader um, in the bank and I worked for the bank for 22 years and I progressed up to quite a um, senior um, level and 
I always used the coaching skills that I learned then. I mean, obviously, over the years, developed a, there was a lot more training, a lot more learning, a lot more development that went into it um, to get to a point where, you know, I, I was really a coach. <laughs> It's like, I don't think I was really a coach after that week's week's course. But but what I loved about it, you know, when I think back now, I'm so pleased that I had the thought I'm a coach now, because without that thought, I probably wouldn't have gone on and worked with people in the way that I did. And over the years, it took me a long time when I was first a manager. I I was not the kind of manager you would have wanted to work for because I was a bit temperamental and a bit moody and a bit stroppy and. Um, if you made a mistake I would shout at you and it took me quite a long time to become more the kind of leader that I really wanted to be which was more understanding really helping people to develop get better in the in their jobs and that was what I took so much pride in helping people to to do well themselves you know every time somebody in my team got promotion like I was so pleased and I know it was down to a lot of the work that I did in helping and encouraging them to 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 grow themselves so that kind of led me so I was a leader who used coaching for you know that the rest of the the time and then there came a point when I decided that I wanted to go self-employed like it was a very very quick decision like I'd never I hadn't thought about wanting to be self-employed before that what happened was I would people would say to me oh you should be self-employed and I'm going "Mm, I don't think so you know I'm single I've got a mortgage to pay I've got nobody to fall back on you know da 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 and then one day and it was March the 5th because it was my dad's birthday I had this thought this this woman was doing a presentation she was um, paralyzed from the chest down and she was talking about how she'd climbed a mountain in the Rockies by just literally, she had a, a, a like a harness built for her and she literally pulled herself up this mountain. And she said, on her first attempt, she failed, but then she had another go. And the thing that made the difference was her mindset. Like nothing else would change. It was just her mindset that was different. And in that moment, I thought, if she can do that, I can do anything. And in the same nanosecond, like I was going self-employed. And then that evening I sat down and I thought, okay, so what am I going to (laughs) do? You know, I don't know what I'll do. And I thought about all the different things that, you know, I enjoyed dancing, uh, enjoyed sports at the time. Um, You know, what can I do? And And I thought actually the best bit of my job for the whole of the previous 20 odd years, because by then I'd moved on to another company, was helping people, coaching people. And I thought, you know something, that's what I'm, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do the best bit of my job all the time. 